could have been clarified uh, if these wordings would have been looked at a little bit more thoroughly. But before we go into that aspect, let me set the stage for, for this uh, occasion of uh, Isra and Mi'raj. I'd like you to go back 1400 years. Consider yourself in the time frame of the Prophet وسلم, although we are not that lucky, but at least we can visualize that intellectually and see ourselves in that situation. Prophet وسلم, is in Mecca. He is among the Quraysh. He has gotten this message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he is busy in preaching this message to his own clan, to his own people. What is the reaction of these people? The reaction is that very few of them have accepted this message. Very few. You can count on numbers or fingers. Majority of these people have rejected this message. While they have rejected this message, a number of years have passed by and we are in the eighth year of Hijrah. And the, in this time frame, we see that the Prophet ﷺ and his people who have accepted this message are being persecuted. They are not being just left alone, they are being persecuted. And there are different ways that people are being persecuted at different levels. Those people who are weak in the society, for example, the slaves who accepted Islam in the first round, they have been persecuted much more. And those people who are the masters of those slaves, they are uh, very active in persecuting them. This, is, this has not stopped to those people who are Muslims only, but it has continued to the point that even Prophet ﷺ is not being spared. There's a planning going on within the Quraysh, how to deal with this situation. We have asked him, we have asked Abu Talib, his uncle, uh, to take care of this matter. This is not being properly handled. And we see continuously that new people are coming to this fold of Islam. And this has become a real problem for the, for the Quraysh at that time. They are thinking that they're losing power. They even saw Hazrat Hamza coming to Islam. They saw Hazrat Umar coming to Islam. And these are, the, these are the stalwarts of Islam. And they are thinking of losing power to Muslims. That is not right. Something has to be done about that. Well, the stages of persecution have gone up, increased. The intensity has increased to a point that they were left with no option but to have these people gather together and be boycotted socially, complete boycott. When these people were boycotted socially, naturally they would not be able to live in the same environment among the same people as they were living at that time. So what would these people do? Where would they go to? Naturally, they, they resorted to a valley in the, in the area which is called the Shab Abi Talib. And this, all of these Muslims, especially the Banu Hashim, they moved to that area because nobody would talk to them, nobody would have anything to deal with them, nobody would give them anything, any food to eat or drink or any business or trade, nothing. Absolute social boycott. And these people, they went over there. Can you imagine all of us sitting over here today being put into that situation? What would happen to us? very difficult situation that they were facing at that time. And this continued for a period of three years. Three solid years this continued. During this time frame, there were children born. During this time frame, 
these people would come out from the hiding only for four months, the Shah al Haram. Those four months, they will come out of that hiding and mix with people. But among, even in those time frame, Prophet Sallallahu his urge to preach Islam would not die down. As a matter of fact, he'll be more enthusiastic because he finds that this is the only opportunity for me. These three mo four months are the only opportunity for me to get to the people, to reach people, to have those caravans who are coming for pilgrimage, to visit them and bring them to Islam. And he's very active in doing that. And that really hurts the Quraysh, the Makkan, very much, very much so. And they begin to think that even this is not working. Even this is not working. Yeah. Now what? The situation with these people has, has come to a point that there is nothing for them to eat. Even they have come to a point that they will eat any, anything that they can lay their hands on. The leaves, the bones, the leftovers, those are the things that they're able to eat. There's nothing left over for them. The cries of children of these people would come out from the valley to this Quraysh. They would listen to it their whole night, but they would not budge from their stand. Can you imagine? Can you imagine your own child crying for one night, two nights, and three nights, and what happens to you or to us? And this is happening for three solid years. Finally, this agreement is voided. Prophet and his people come out from that hiding place. This was a very big trial for him. Very big trial for him at that time. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his ways are different. When he comes to try somebody, he, he really tries them hard. Until it's found out for sure whether the person is, or there's any good left in that person, otherwise he will be shook up. Right after he comes out of this place, this Shuaba B. Talib or boycott, his biggest supporter in life, he leaves him. Abu Talib dies. While Abu Talib is dying on his deathbed, the Meccans come to him when they find out that this is, now he's dying, and they want to make sure that a solution is reached at this point. So they make him an offer. Abu Talib, you be the mediator between your nephew and ourselves. And we make a proposal that he doesn't do or doesn't say anything to our God and we will have nothing to do with him. Prophet Sallallahu and some of his colleagues are being brought into this discussion and the Quraysh explained to him this situation and what is his reply? What is his reply? He said, one word. Give me the assurance of one word. And you will have, you will reign over the whole earth. What is that word? Accept Islam. Can you imagine a man in this position? He has he has been going through this persecution for three years. His biggest supporter is, is on the deathbed. And his vision is, you accept this message and you are going to reign on this whole world. Can you imagine that? The conviction that he had, the understanding of this message he had, he knew it. He knew what he was talking about. Quraysh did not know. That was the problem.
Quraysh did not understand him. The result is that they go away and say, well, we cannot deal with this man. He is totally obsessed with his message. We just don't know how to deal with him. Abu Talib dies, and next thing what happens? He's another supporter in life. His, his own beloved wife, Khadija, she departs. Prophet ﷺ is left with absolutely no support or comfort at, that, at this particular point. This shock was a very, very big shock. That ear was considered the Amul Huzn, the ear of grief. Meccan have almost rejected his message. There is no good soul left in Mecca. Prophet ﷺ thinks of going to somebody else or some other place. He goes to Taif. And you all know the story of Taif. When he comes back from that place, he is bleeding. He cannot enter the, the Mecca until such time that one of these kafir gives him the, the relief and the support. And he asks for that. And he, this kafir sends his three sons with the armor, and then he enters the Mecca. That is the situation that Prophet ﷺ is facing at that particular point. You can imagine the, 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 his mental condition at that point, where he, he might have been. You can imagine his state of mind at that point, where he, it might have been. Allah subhanahu, subhanahu wa ta'ala's trial is almost over. The time has come to reward him. The time has come to let him know what is there in store for him. The time has come to let him know that the new door is going to be opened up. The time has come for him, for him to know that a new era is, has to be, uh, has to be uh, come about and begin. The time has come for him to know that there is another way for him to deal with the situation. The time has come for him to know that there is a st that from now on things are going to be more structured. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls him to his presence. The story of the Isra and Maharaj has been related by 25 companions. Among those are Hat Omar, Hat Ali, Hazrat Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Masood, and many others. Prophet ﷺ is being taken from Masjid Aqsa to Masjid Haram to Masjid Aqsa, and there he prays, and then from there he is being taken up to the seven heavens, a place where even the, the highest of angels cannot go beyond. Siddhatul Muntaha. Hadar Jibreel said, if I move an inch further from here, I'm going to be burned. This is my limit. I cannot cross that. You are on your own beyond this point. Prophet ﷺ is taken to that point. And what is the purpose of this? Bringing, bringing him over there. The purpose of him to be brought over there is where what Quran says here, so that we might show him some of our signs. That's the whole purpose, to show him some of our signs. Why? Why to show him some of our signs? He has seen already some signs. He has seen the Jibrail, alayhi salatu wasalam. Right? He has seen him coming in different form and shapes. He has seen the message being recited to him. Those are the signs already there. But what additional signs? And why? That's where the difference comes in between a paygambar or a messenger 
and the philosopher. Both have a message. Both carry a message. And both influence people with their message. But one knows from the depth of his heart, and one has witnessed it. The other one has a knowledge that has brought him to that point. He himself does not necessarily has the firm faith in what he's saying, because he has not seen it. That is the difference between a philosopher and a, and a uh, messenger. He knows. He has witnessed that. So when he says something, he says with great conviction. But when a philosopher says something, he doesn't know himself whether that is true or not, because it's still a philosophy. Let's come to the other aspect, or other perspective of that. Prophet ﷺ comes back from that, and then he talks to people about this. I have been taken from this place to that place, and these are the things I have seen. And he describes that in so detail, it's unbelievable. I mean, he describes the Masjid Aqsa in its real form. He describes the people who are coming, who are on their way from that end of the world to, the, to Mecca, all the caravans which are coming. He describes very, very minor details. And what is the response of the uh, Quraysh? Quraysh say that, my God, I just can't believe this. This man can go from here, this point, to that point, which we usually take a month to go and a month to come back. And he says that he did it all in one night. Let me ask you this. When Quraysh said no, was that unusual? When the Quraysh said no, we don't believe in it, was that unusual? When Abu Bakr said that I believe in it, was that unusual? Why not? When Quraysh say that it is, it is unbelievable, we do not believe in this, what you have said. Actually, it is not, it is not the Prophet wasalam, that didn't believe him. It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that didn't believe. When Abu Bakr said that I believe in it, he wasn't believing in the Prophet wasalam. He was believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the difference in perspective of these two groups of people. And the third group that was in there, which was the weak Muslims, that's where they didn't get to. They, had, they were halfway through. They, they were Muslim, but they, didn't, they haven't really they gotten the firm faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why they were shook up. As a matter of fact, if you really think about it, the, the uh, Iman bil Ghaib that was there at the time of the Prophet wasallam was exactly of the same nature as it is today. Although we do not see Prophet wasallam, we have not seen him, we have not spoken to him, or we have no contact with him. But when he was alive, the Iman bil Ghaib was exactly this, of the same nature as it is today, when we do not see him. Why? The people who lived with him at that time, they did not live with the Muhammad Rasulullah. They lived with Muhammad Ibn Abdullah. He was a man that they lived with. And that's the man that we miss. We do not know. We have not seen him. We have no contact with Muhammad Ibn Abdullah. But the nature of Muhammad ibn Abdullah being the Muhammad Rasulullah was exactly the same at that time as it is today. Nobody saw an angel coming down to him. Nobody saw a tablet being written and brought to him. Nobody saw how he spoke, from where did he, he speak. 
So the Iman bil Ghayr was exactly of the same nature at that time as it is today. There is no difference. So some people when they say that, it is written in the book only. We don't know. It is the it is where it is where our conviction stops. We think we think that what is there in the Quran and what is there in the hadith is somebody's writing that has that come has come to us. We do not have firm faith whether it was really revealed to him in, in the same way as we see it here or not. There is a little bit of a dilemma that we have in our in our mind. And that is where we need to understand. The the act act of ascension or the the Mi'raj was actually the is, it was the deed of the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why when the Quran says it starts out with these words, Subhanallah Yasra bi Abdi. Glory to God who did take his servant for a journey by night. Why did it start with this glory to God? If it was just a vision, it was if it was just a spiritual uh, movement, there is no need to have to say this glory to God. What is so big about it? We all have vision, don't we? <coughs> we all go from one place to another place. We have never even thought about it in our daily life. We see ourselves in a state that we cannot even imagine when we are awake. If he did the same thing, what was the big deal about it? If it was just a spiritual uh, journey, what was the big, big deal about it? There have been so many people after Prophet wasallam who had a spiritual journey from one place to another, their body still there, was there. That's where a lot of, of, of Muslims, scholars even, have faltered when they said that probably it was a vision, probably it was a spiritual uh, uh, transformation. Let's look at one more thing here. When, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, who did take his servant? Prophet sallallahu has been addressed in the Quran many different ways. Some place he has been addressed by his name. Some place he has been addressed by the word Nabi. Some, some place he has been addressed by the word Rasul. And some place he has been addressed by the word Ab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not used these words just for the heck of it. He knows what is behind that. Where he used the word Ab, he is actually looking at the, the state of the uh, Bashariyat. And here he has used the word Ab. He didn't use the word Nabi. He didn't use the word Rasul. He could have used that word. But being an Abd explains that he was in the exact state of a human being when he was taken, taken from one place to another place. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's why I said, the words which are, which are brought in here are, are chosen very cautiously and have been chosen to portray exact same meaning as it is supposed to be. Those are the two perspectives that I mentioned to you where we had, we had gone through the historical aspect and the issues that have been raised later on. Now let's talk about what was in it for Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and what is in it for us. When he was raised to the heaven, he was given two things at that point. One thing that he was given was a was verses from the Quran that was given to him at that point, and those were the verses that I recited at the 
يا ايشا برير لله ما في السماوات وما في الارض and the second thing that was given to him was the salat and to get a better appreciation of what we are talking about let's look at those two things and then we will be able to see what is the uh, significance of that let me read you the meaning of those verses that i recited in the the prayer to god belongeth all that is in the heavens and on earth whether you show what is in your minds or conceal it god calleth you to account for it he forgiveth whom he pleaseth and punisheth whom he pleaseth for god hath power over all things now while i'm reading this thing through you need to keep the the uh, the uh, the setup in the background of the people and of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and who he was dealing with the apostle believed in what had been revealed to him from his lord as do the men of faith each one of them believed in god his angels his books and his apostles we make no distinction they say between one and another of his apostles and they say <coughs> excuse me we hear and we obey we seek thy forgiveness our lord and to thee is the end of all journeys a no soul that god placed a burden greater than it can bear and it gets every good that it earns and it suffers every ill that it earns pray our lord condemn us not if we forgot forget or fall into error our lord lay not on us a burden that like that which thou didst lay on those before us our lord lay not us on us a burden greater than we have strength to bear blot out our sins and grant us forgiveness have mercy on us thou art our protector help us against those who stand against faith if you have that background in which prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was living at that time you can imagine that these ayah these verses provide tremendous amount of comfort to him he was out on a limb his best friend had departed him his best supporter had departed him he was living at the mercy basically of those kufar yet he was steadfast on his message he was he was persevering on his conviction he needed support these ayah as as we recited here and got the meaning of it does not provide any sort of a malice against those who were persecuting him or his people however it does provide ways for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and for the people to ask for forgiveness from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to ask them not to put the load beyond what they can 